Welcome back. Futures are indicating a, a gain at the start of trading this morning after yesterday's sharp sell-off. The Dow Industrials right now up 128. The Nasdaq is up 75. Yesterday, a different story. The Dow, the S&P, and the Nasdaq all seeing the worst day since June 2020. After that, how did the expected CPI report we told you about yesterday? The tech sector yesterday led the sell-off. Take a look at the stocks, uh, which uh, led the averages lower, and it was a crushing. Joining us right now is the Bonson Group CEO and CIO. He is the founder and managing partner. Uh, and the author of There's No Free Lunch, 250 Economic Truths, David Bonson. This is what we want from you this morning, David. The truth. Good to see you. Good to see you, Maria. So how would you assess yesterday's market uh, plunge? Well, look, the half full part of the glass is that it was just taking away four days of gains before. But we were at a low point, you know, in early September. That sell off in the second half of August was quite severe. It speaks to the reality of an unstable monetary policy coming out of this moment is going to lead to ongoing market volatility. You still basically have an okay earnings growth environment. It's going to be about mid-single digits. It's just that the multiples have come way down, which is what's killed tech and other high multiples. Any investor for a while who's dependent on multiple expansion is not going to be happy. You have to have organic cash flow growth to make money right now. Adam, what do you think? Well, unfortunately, I'm on the flip side of what David just mentioned. As a growth investor, uh, a lot of my names don't have the cash flow. And I've had to actively pivot from the high-risk names into the higher quality. Unfortunately, even the higher quality ones have come down. Mm -hmm. It's been hard. So, so where do you hide? Is there anywhere to hide? Well, I don't think it's hiding. I think you just proactively want to be in places that have a good balance sheet and good, stable, free cash flow growth. The problem is they're never going to be super exciting. But we like some of the healthcare pharma names. We certainly still continue to love energy. It's a little less on the producers. I've been a midstream guy for a long time. It's held up very well. Oil's come down 20%. Midstream's still up. And it's up in the 30s on the year. But you're talking about six, seven percent dividend yields in midstream energy. That's amazing. And natural gas is not going anywhere, nor is our need as a country to transport it. Well, that's the place to be. And uh, I'm wondering when you say the uh, you're not uh, into the oil producers, is that because you think the economy really is going down and demand's going to be less? Or you think the regulatory environment is too hostile? Why are you not uh, into oil producers right now? We own Chevron and Exxon in our portfolio, but I would love to be heavier into some of the riskier, more levered names. The problem is that there was free money to be made there out of, after COVID, and that money's gone. Like, the easy returns are gone. So on a risk-adjusted basis, we like midstream more than upstream. I'm not afraid of the upstream. I think that the production still has to go. They're making plenty of money at $82 oil, but it's different than when we were at $50 oil. We've had a big, easy run-up, and I just think it's more volatile in the upstream. And, and these companies do not have the same businesses. They're not investing in the projects that they would have invested in because of this push on no, ESG. No, and they're not it's not just ESG and governmental. Those are the two biggest factors. Yeah. I blame the Biden administration and ESG. But even the shareholders don't want them to be as levered as they used to be. They're tired of the boom bust cycles that our Permian Basin names were in for quite a while. With regard, David, to the energy sector, what is the impact of this impending energy crisis in Europe going to no. have on American stock market and on American energy stock? I don't want to be cynical and start uh, gleefully celebrating other people's pain because it's not how I feel. Feel. I think it's awful. But the lesson is completely obvious. We cannot be dependent on Middle Eastern autocrats or Putin. And the fact of the matter is that Europe is going to have to get natural gas from America in the future. The LNG export world is in early, early innings. For now, they're going to start going to coal. They're going to start having to do other things that are more short term. Germany is not ready to import any more than we're ready to export what real demand is. But an export of LNG LNG is a huge future for American is, is natural there, gas. Excuse me, is there going to be an, a cascading effect onto our stock market over this winter, given the crunch that Europe is going to face? I don't want to say no, because that usually comes back to bite portfolio managers, but I don't, I cannot imagine it isn't priced in. Who doesn't know that no. it's coming? Right. So I, I just have to believe A lot of expectations. Price. Europe goes into recession first. That worsens the, the performance of the U.S. economy. But we want to talk about inflation. Adam, what's yeah. your take? We got the producer price index out this morning. It's the last inflation yes. data point before the Fed September meeting, and that's why this is going to be even more important for the Federal Reserve after the CPI of up 8.3 percent. Agreed. Well, first of all, as far as the rate hike next week is concerned, I think 75 basis points is automatic. Some people are saying 100. I don't think we need to go that far. In terms of the PPI this morning, um, and again, you know me, I tend to be an optimist. That's what American ingenuity is all about. Um, but PPI is a leading indicator compared to CPI. In other words, first you need to get the raw 
raw materials, you make the stuff, then you send it to market. So PPI prices, it's possible that we will actually see them uh, go down. That becomes a leading indicator, and that might be helpful, and we, we get back some of what we lost yesterday. Well, I, I, I agree. I think a big part of the issue with the inflation numbers, uh, look, long term, I've been in the camp for a long time that I wish we were talking more about downward pressure on growth, that a Japan-like deflation is more concerning to me over the next 10, 20 years. In the next 10, 20 months, food prices were the big surprise yesterday. Energy prices have come down. But I think when you look at wholesale inputs, that probably will start putting downward pressure, still high inflation rate. But the lagging effect of the way they calculate rents and housing is the big issue. I think that the inflation numbers are going to start getting better, and they're not going to really feel like it, or or you're not going to see it in the data, because they're still capturing rent increases from four months ago, Mm. five months ago. It's an awkward methodology. And And, then the Fed's in the the Fed's in the weird position yeah. of having to act like they're still inflation hawkish when they know they can raise 100 basis points. It's sure. not going to make a difference. Wow. This is supply side driven. They get no fiscal support. There's no marginal tax decreases, no deregulation, no energy independence. Those are the things that would bring inflation down, and they're not going to do Don't that. forget about what Thomas Honig told us yesterday on this program. He's expecting a severe recession, a sizable recession, because the Federal Reserve is going to keep this fight uh, against inflation with these significant rate hikes. So we'll be watching what happens next week. David, great to get your insight. Thanks, Maria. Thank you so much. David Bonson joining us. Quick break and then press.